Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and we are continuing with part two of my series on my reusable Kerbal Space Program. And what we're doing is now we're launching part number three of our space station, and this is a, an, R, an RCS uh, fuel storage system. Now you see the, the rocket here being used in a new configuration. We have these SRBs strapped around the outside to help with the initial launch. Now, uh, these are all in parachutes, of course, so when we drop them, they're going to land very close to the launch site and be able to get reused. And this is almost preferable to the alternative uh, in some situations where we drop the very expensive and fragile jet engines and we drop them essentially flying over the ocean so they travel a lot further. This is actually, it, it makes more sense in a number of ways. But anyway, after dropping those, we, we continue into orbit and uh, we rendezvous with the station. Now, we're not going to actually dock this directly now because we have our little space tug. Our cute little space tug. Little RCS uh, tiny barrel of fun it is, basically. And it, it's going to come across, across the tiny distance. Uh, it, I guess it looks like R2-D2, maybe? No, it doesn't. I don't know what it looks like. But it's just going to fly across there, pluck this object off, and then uh, it'll maneuver it back over and connect it to the station. And that way, we don't have this really large spacecraft trying to maneuver around this space station. Because not only is that spacecraft very heavy, uh, it me it's not very maneuverable. It means you're going to use a lot more RCS fuel. But also, if things go wrong... That spacecraft has a lot of momentum and is more likely to do damage to the spacecraft. So by parking it a reasonable distance off, we can bring everything together and hopefully everything will be safe. At least that's the plan. Of course, things never quite go. But here we here we can watch everything in super high speed as I as you see that this thing is not the most stable. Uh, yes, uh, there are five rows of RCS. There's two sets of RCS on the capsule on the the probe and there's a set of rcs for each of those uh fuel tanks <laughs> now you, you understand with all those rcs jets why i'm putting the rcs tank up first because we're going to be using this little tug a lot to build this station and we want to keep refueling it that's why the rcs tank is going up before any of the regular fuel tanks or the docking adapters or anything but yeah, we're just going to bring this down here. It's kind of hard, but there we go. We now have our spacecraft. And a few minutes later, we can bring the spacecraft back to its landing site. 22 kilometers, not bad. And the whole mission only took two hours. Anyway, onwards with launch number four. This is going to be the docking array where we basically hook all the large spacecraft onto. It's essentially a large coat hanger where you can kind of hang spacecraft so you can pick you know which one you're going to fly for the day based upon you know what's in fashion i guess um it's going to be kind of essential it just basically adds a whole bunch of uh, things there it's no, it's all entirely structural you notice that i've changed my strategy a little and i put uh rcs thrusters on the end there uh, and the idea is i tested the model in the simulation with the the little space tug on board and uh, have made it balanced uh, assuming I can turn off one set of, of thrusters on the space tug and that's the way it's going to work from now on it'll be a whole lot easier but this was a relatively painless experience uh, just bringing this thing out easily gently and sliding across the distance into space so far not a problem. So, um, yeah, a bunch of people are saying, oh, why, why aren't you using space planes for your reusable space program? And my response to them is, I would love to use space planes, but they're incredibly hard to balance correctly, especially when you are launching hardware into space and having to land without that hardware. It's very hard to make a spacecraft that doesn't want to flip the hell out and kill you repeatedly and that doesn't work very well in a reusable space program you know just because it's theoretically landable does not mean that it is landable in practice <laughs> i mean you know if you look at your fully reusable spacecraft designs the only one that really uh has got had really got much development was the the x-33 which was actually a small scale like mock-up essentially a test bed for what would be called the venture star 
That was a Lockheed Martin, I believe. They wanted to um, build a single stage to orbit capable vehicle, and the whole thing was a lifting body design using an aerospike engine, which was, of course, you know, huge new technology at the time. Uh, but the big thing about it was the whole lifting body was the fuel tank, and they had these fancy carbon fiber fuel tank designs that were in, uh, that would contain all the fuel, and it would still be able to glide on those on the way back when they were empty. The problem they ended up having was that they couldn't get the fuel tanks to hold their structural integrity through the flight, and uh, they, because, mostly because they were weird shapes. But that problem has since been solved. It's just not sure that there's there's particularly the desire to go for a full single stage to orbit vehicle in real life. Anyway, we're on to the next launch, and we're going to attach a similar structure for all the fuel tanks that we're going to need on this space station. It is the fuel tank array, uh, also known as the giant coat hanger of fuel tanks. Um, now this one, uh, I, I've shown you the whole in encounter here, because it was pretty darn sweet. 1.1 kilometer encounter, not bad, huh? Yeah, 1.1 kilometers from launch, no, uh, you know, random adjusting of my orbit. So now I just had to wait for the thing to come up. And uh, once it caught up, I would accelerate up to orbital velocity and perform the docking. That's the plan, huh? And we all know how, what plans are, are good for. Plans are good for uh, not working out or something like that. I don't know, this flu is really getting to me. <laughs> there we go, coming in. Just going to use, use main engines and stop. And now start moving in under RCS fuel. I literally burned out up every single drop of fuel I had to get that rendezvous. This launcher does have pretty good reserves of RCS fuel. And as it turns out, I was a little too conservative early on. And you can bring this whole thing back to the planet and land it safely using RCS fuel alone. You don't need any of that transferring fuel into the jet engines thing. That would have been me just being a little overly uh, conservative with my fuel margins, let's say. Anyway, we're in close enough now, we're going to park the spacecraft, get the space tug out, and tow this thing across to bolt on to our grand space station, which I still have not yet named. I mean, it's not like I don't have a name picked out, it's that whenever I'm in space, I forget to right-click on the, the spacecraft and rename it to something. In fact, I still think it looks like a rocket while it's in space. It's rather embarrassing, especially when I go to launch and I see that it's still, uh, it doesn't look like a space station. Anyway, we're uh, coming into dock here with the, or pick up this object. You see it burning its copious quality quantities of uh, RCS fuel there. Uh, I probably should have disabled ASAS. But as it turns out, um, having ASAS on multiple ships causes all sorts of interesting problems when they're in close proximity. Um... Or maybe that was one of the problems. I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going on. But yeah, I'm, I'm pulling this away now. We're going to maneuver over towards the, the spacecraft. And, well, it's starting to look a little odd. You see, as I'm approaching to come in, the space station isn't oriented the way it should be. There's something weird going on here. So, after numerous tweaks trying to persuade either of the onboard automatic control systems that I really do want it to point north on the map so that it can hold still while I dock. Uh, I re retry the docking, it fails, it rotates out of phase. I've no idea what caused this, so I decide to go in for the docking completely manually, trying to figure out the exact orientation of the target docking port using only the external models. It's not the, the most uh, well-established science, let's say. Squad, really, one of the things I, I think you really need for the next version is a third marker on the nav ball during docking, which shows you the orientation of the, the target port. If you have that, then it's a case of lining up the, the position vector, the velocity vector, and this uh, orientation vector, and then you'd be perfectly aligned to dock. You could also add, like, a rotation vector to the same display, you know, for people that are, like, totally OCD about getting their spacecraft to link up the way they saw them in the, the uh, vehicle assembly building. Of course, it doesn't help that even after accounting for the, the RCS distribution and uh, using fine controls, this thing was still very hard to fly and actually turned very quickly. 
several occasions I kept on thinking I was going to smack into those solar, solar panels and um, basically ruin my space station early on. I'm not sure what I would have done. I guess I would have had to force myself to tow the broken part back to the planet and get it repaired or something. I'm not quite sure. We'll we'll come to that when it happens. Now, I am looking at mods like uh, the Kerbal Attachment System to let me uh, pick up those old stages that I've returned to the planet, refuel them, and maybe even put new stages on top. That's a plan. I haven't actually done this yet, uh, and we're going to see how well it works. It may not actually be particularly feasible, but... What is feasible is that we are finally going to dock after quite possibly the longest docking attempt in my KSP history. This thing finally joins to its master and we have a new space station component. Now at this point a slight problem presents itself. You see, that large tank of monopropellant is sitting right next to the accommodation section and uh, we really don't want it that close. Ideally, we wanted it attached to the fuel array, and that was one of the ideas. But the problem was that some moron decided to launch the docking array first. So, now we are performing a delicate operation to remove this uh, dock, this fuel tank, and uh, shift it to the back of the station. So, you can see that this is a slow and tedious operation, where we're going to delicately fly things around using this tiny space tug again. Now I'm sure the Book of Operational Procedures doesn't say anything about uh, pushing these uh, tanks around by, from the side. Uh, it probably says only handle by the ends. Well, uh, screw that because it would take forever. So I just nudge it out of the way and bring the spacecraft around, or the, bring the tug around to grab the node in the center of the docking array. And once the tank is far enough out of the way, I can just you know, motor forward and stick it delicately back onto the station. And then from that point on, it'll be a case of chasing after that tank before it flies too far away. Now at this point, I start thinking, did I remember to refuel the space tug before I started this? Well, it's too late now. <laughs> we just got to get this docking array docked back onto the station and then we can go after our fuel supply, uh, should we need it again. I guess there is that rocket that's still sitting nearby that we could probably borrow some fuel off of if we needed to. Now I'm sure some of you are wondering whether a real space tug of this design has ever been envisaged. And Well, the term space tug actually tends to refer to um, spacecraft that would take uh, other payloads between the Earth and the Moon, uh, basically. Um, a, a something like this is more like a construction vehicle, it's like a bobcat or something, and really it doesn't have, exist. The, the thing that you would have is the robotic arm that is on the space station and on the space shuttle. Uh, it makes much more sense to move things around using robotic arms because anchoring everything means that you're not having to waste RCS fuel on station keeping. But... If you've tried using the robotics pack with docking, you know that that way leads to madness and things exploding. Actually, now I think about it, large parts of the game lead to madness and things exploding. Except that this would involve robots, so it would be some sort of, like, crazy robotic explosion. In space! Anyway, coming back to the situation at hand, you can see how much fun I'm not having trying to steer this thing again. Uh, so much RCS that it wants to spin out of control, even, no matter what key you touch. Even if you push the SAS button, it kind of spins around in the spot doing a little dance, kind of teasing me, saying, Ah, I'm so difficult to fly! Because, you know, if rocket engines had voices, that's the kind of voice that RCS would have, right? Anyway, after that horrible mess of flying, let's go back and show you how it's supposed to be done. This is the proper fuel tank. This is going to carry... It'll be a receptacle for uh, the fuel supply, and we'll be able to fit about six of these on this fuel array, and... Right now we're only launching one at a time and in fact when it gets up there it's not even going to have that much fuel in it because we're going to use most of that fuel getting it into space, sadly enough. There will be another uh, scheme set out for actually filling these tanks but right now we're just bringing it up into space. This is launch number six and you're going to see this whole thing in one take, no edits. There is, uh, could be completely undiluted um, fail or skill, depending upon how you look at it. And you can see I've got an encounter of less than four kilometers. That's pretty good, straight from launch. 
we're just going to wait for this thing to get close enough and then once we get close enough what happens is the nav ball switches from orbital uh, to target mode so I'll be able to nullify my velocity with respect to the target and then proceed to move in and uh, perform the docking. And in this case it worked out so well that I didn't even need the space tug, everything was all lined up and it was just a case of slow boating in with a great grace and elegance. As the space station drew close it was clear that everything was aligned, all the stars aligned for me. Um, one thing to notice though at this stage though is the velocity vector on the overview or not the overview, I'm talking about EVE, on the nav ball, it starts to oscillate around like crazy. And, and this is a problem with all the large structures in the game. Just like very small corrections to the physics mean that the thing will wobble back and forth. And this wobble gets added to the velocity component. So your velocity component will randomly bump around. And it becomes a case of not so much using the exact position as more trying to guesstimate where the middle is also known as using the force. You just rely on the motion of that pink position vector and if that starts getting off center then you know adjust based on that. Or you could just use one of the docking camera mods that are out there. Regardless of what you do I have just delivered a fuel tank number one to the space station. It is not fueled, we will need a few other launches to actually refuel it. But the station is largely in final functional form right now. We can easily put up to five more of those fuel tanks on there as mission needs dictate, but at the moment it is ready and open for business I believe. We'll probably see its first passengers passing through in the next episode or so I would say. Until then, I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.